headlines. North Korea blasts South Korea and the United States for their, quote, hostile policies that it says are hampering peace efforts. Experts say the outburst could be a sign the regime wants to restart talks. Russia and Turkey agreed to jointly patrol Syria's northeastern border after the withdrawal of Kurdish fighters. As far as outcomes go, the U.S. withdrawal of troops could hardly look any better from the view of those in Moscow. Plus, Tottenham Hotspur's South Korean striker Son Hung Min joins an exclusive club following a two-goal performance in the Champions League. He's now the joint highest South Korean scorer in European football history. Let's start in Japan today, now into the second day of his three-day stay in Tokyo. South Korean Prime Minister Lee nak has a packed schedule, which will be topped off by a dinner banquet hosted by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Watchers say the two PMs may hold a brief conversation before their official sit-down that is slated for Thursday. Earlier on this Wednesday, he is scheduled to meet a number of politicians from different parties, as well as former Prime Minister and the current President of the Organising Committee for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, Yoshiro Mori. A town hall meeting is also scheduled with around 20 Japanese college students to discuss bilateral relations between the two countries. Reports say he wished the Japanese people and Japan's new emperor happiness in the Reiwa era during Tuesday's enthronement ceremony. South Korea and Spain will hold a summit in Seoul this afternoon ahead of the 70th anniversary of their diplomatic ties in 2020. President Moon Jae-in and Spanish King Felipe VI will discuss ways to strengthen bilateral economic, scientific and cultural cooperation. President Moon's drive for peace on the Korean Peninsula will also be on the table. After the talks, the two sides will sign a set of MOUs, followed by a dinner banquet. King Felipe VI is on a two-day state visit to South Korea, the first by a Spanish king uh, in 23 years. Now, a senior North Korean military official has lashed out at South Korea and the United States, saying the regime's efforts to build what it says is eternal peace are really being uh, in vain because of their hostile policies. Analysts interpret the remarks as a strategy to resume stalled denuclearization talks with the United States. Kim Hyo-sun with the details. North Korea's Vice Defense Minister Kim hyong leong has been speaking out about the working level Pyongyang-Washington nuclear talks that were recently broken off in Sweden. Speaking at the 9th Shangsan Forum in Beijing this week, he blamed Washington's hostile policies for exacerbating tensions. Kim also pointed out that South Korea's purchase of dozens of F-35A fighter jets from the U.S. and the Seoul Washington joint drills are negatively affecting inter-Korean ties. He also said North Korea's efforts to build lasting peace were in vain due to such actions. Pursuing malicious intentions for gaining military supremacy over a dialogue partner completely contradicts the co-spirit of the DPRK-US joint statement and the North-South declarations, in which they promised before the international society to suspend in comprehensive ways all kinds of hostilities causing military tension and conflicts. Despite the pessimistic tone, pundits say the regime intends to leverage such criticism to resume the stalled talks. North Korea will come back to the negotiating table when President Trump promised to seize South Korea-U.S. joint military drills. That would be the minimum condition to resume talks. The North continues to pressure Seoul and Washington, stressing it will further push towards self-reliance. For South Korea, however, it's not easy to halt weapon procurement nor the joint military drills as it needs to consider its alliance with Washington as well as the military capabilities of its neighbors like China and Japan. Therefore, it remains to be seen what new strategies can be taken by the two Koreas and U.S. to find a breakthrough in the stalled denuclearism talks. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. 
North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has criticised his own regime for being overly reliant on South Korea for tourism at the North's famous Mount Gumgang. According to its state-run Nodong Shinmun newspaper on Wednesday, Kim inspected tourist sites at the mountain and instructed all South Korean facilities be removed and be rebuilt in a modern way by North Korean workers. However, Kim stressed that he'll welcome South Korean tourists to Mount Gumgang anytime, but added it was a mistaken idea for the mountain to be viewed as a symbol of North-South relations. The World Organization for Animal Health has reportedly urged North Korea to submit an official report on the status of its African swine fever outbreak. According to Voice of America, the organization is working to gather more information as the outbreak is worsening in neighboring countries. The report claims Pyongyang has not provided any updates at all to the organization since its first outbreak was reported in May. It also highlighted the need for cooperative quarantine measures from the two Koreas in order to contain the animal disease. So far, 10 dead wild boars uh, found near the border have tested positive for African swine fever. Yet another aerial incursion by Russia. A total of six Russian military aircraft entered South Korea's Air Defense Identification Zone, or the Kadits, on Tuesday. The South Korean Air Force responded quickly by scrambling its own fighter jets. Kim Jong reports. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said a Russian A-50 early warning aircraft, three Soy-27 fighter jets and two Tu-95 bombers entered the Korean Air Defense Identification Zone Tuesday between 9.23 a.m. and 3.13 p.m. Korea time. What stood out during the intrusion was that the T-95 bomber stayed inside Cadiz for about two hours, flying in a U-shaped trajectory near Korea's western port city of Poang, the southernmost island of Jeju, and then towards the northwesterly direction towards the West Sea. The Joint Chiefs said the intrusion prompted the South Korean military to scramble some 10 fighter jets and take measures to prevent the Russian aircraft from advancing closer to Korean airspace. Including two stage four entries, Russian planes have entered Cadiz 20 times so far this year. In July, Seoul's foreign and defense ministry summoned officials from the Russian embassy to lodge strong protests for entering Cadiz and Korean airspace. The intent of the recent intrusions by the Russians are unspecified, but Seoul's defense ministry said the two countries will be holding a joint defense committee meeting for two days in Seoul starting Wednesday. They're slated to discuss the signing of a memorandum of understanding to establish a military hotline between their air forces to prevent further accidental entries into each other's air defense identification zones. Kim ji Arirang News. South Korea and the United States are set to begin another round of negotiations in Hawaii for defense cost sharing from Tuesday to Thursday local time before leaving South Korea on Tuesday. Seoul's newly appointed top negotiator, Jong Eun Bo, said he will ensure Seoul makes a reasonable and equitable financial contribution to the U.S. The negotiations on the 11th Special Measures Agreement will decide how much Seoul needs to pay next year for the upkeep of over 28,000 U.S. troops stationed here in South Korea. The agreement for 2019 called for South Korea to pay 886 million U.S. dollars, an increase of 8.2 percent from the previous year. Now in sports, Tottenham Hotspur striker Son Heung Min scored twice on Tuesday night during Champions League play in London, helping his team to a crucial three points in Group B with his brace. Son also tied a goal scoring record held for decades by a South Korean legend. Lee Sung Jae reports. With Tottenham Hotspur taking on Serbian side Red Star Belgrade at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on Tuesday night. South Korean striker Son Heung Min found the back of the net twice, once in the 16th minute and the other just before the first half whistle. The double gave him a second straight UCL match with a goal and his fifth goal in all competitions this season, making the night even more special. 
Son's brace gave him his 120th and 121st goal in European matches, tying the record for the most European goals by a South Korean player, a record held for years by legendary Korean footballer Cha bong -un. This means one more goal, either in a Premier League or Champions League match, will make him the sole record holder. Having an incredible 2018-19 season with the London side, including a runner-up finish in last season's Champions League, Son became the only Asian footballer to be on the list of 30 nominees for this year's Ballon d'Or. Son is only the third South Korean footballer to be nominated for the award after Sar gi hyun in 2002 and Park Ji-sung in 2005. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Now, in health-related news, the South Korean government is set to reveal follow-up measures for liquid-type e-cigarettes, which it has recommended smokers to refrain from using. The Ministry of Health and Welfare is scheduled to hold a pan-governmental briefing on the matter on this Wednesday. The Ministry recommends smokers who smoke e-cigarettes to refrain from using their devices until it completes a probe into the correlation between liquid-type e-cigarettes and lung diseases. After months of relatively clear skies, fine dust has once again reared its unwanted head here in South Korea. Identifying prevention as better than cure, Seoul is holding a number of events to promote transitions to a more green way of living. Our chair, Jong Yoon, went to the Global Green Growth Week Summit and filed this report. South Korea has the second highest levels of fine dust out of 36 OECD countries. And out of the 100 cities in the OECD with the worst dust levels, 44 are located in Korea. Amid growing concerns over air pollution, the National Council on Climate and Air Quality has called for the strongest measures yet to reduce fine dust emissions by 20 percent from last year's levels. Those measures, including stricter bans on all diesel cars and reducing the operation of coal power plants, Seoul has recently taken action such as an alternate new driving day system for public workers as well. Experts say, however, that while cracking down on activities that create emissions, the government also needs to find approaches for green transitions by using taxation as a policy instrument. We have to look at different economic incentives, such as those set by governments through taxes or subsidies that sends price signals to all the actors in the economy, from companies to private citizens, about our production and consumption decisions. Expanding measures to promote renewable energy and green growth, Korea will hold a second P4G, partnering for green growth and the Global Goals 2030 Summit in Seoul next June. This comes after President Moon Jae-in proposed Seoul's vision for green growth at the P4G Summit's first edition in Denmark last year. The key part of having someone, a country like the Republic of Korea, is it itself has grown very quickly. It provides an example of how to grow in the future as it goes through its own transition, but also how other developing countries can make that accelerated transition. The vision states that economic growth and environmental issues are not trade-offs but mutually reinforce each other. A global initiative hosted by 12 countries and six international organizations, the P4G looks for new business and financial models that can drive green developments. The key agenda of 2020 Seoul Summit will be partnerships between the public and private sectors in order to bring sustainable inclusive growth and action on climate change. Choi jong Yoon, Arirang News. Britain's planned departure from the European Union next week has once again been thrown into turmoil after the UK Parliament rejected Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Brexit timetable. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Kim Dami. So Dami, tell us more about this parliamentary rejection and also the uh, deepening uncertainty surrounding what's going to happen with Brexit. Mark, the clocks are ticking to the October 31st deadline, but members of parliament again dealt a fresh blow to Prime Minister Johnson on Tuesday by voting down his timetable to pass a Brexit legislation. 
Lawmakers voted 322-308 against a motion which planned a three-day schedule to proceed with the legislation, which is what the British government says is necessary to achieve a Brexit on time. The Prime Minister, of course, expressed deep regret over the turnout. And we now face further uncertainty, and the EU must now make up their minds uh, uh, over how to answer Parliament's request for a delay. In the Earlier in the day, and for the first time, Parliament signaled support for the deal on how the UK will leave the EU by backing Johnson's withdrawal agreement bill. Lawmakers voted 329 to 299 in favor of the Brexit deal at an important second reading, which would allow the agreement to be debated and possibly amended. Johnson said it was Parliament, not the government, that had requested a three-month extension until January 31, 2020, adding he would inform EU leaders that it was still his policy to leave the EU by the end of the month. While the Prime Minister remains committed to leave the EU next week, EU Council President Donald Tusk said he would recommend accepting Britain's request for an extension. The five-day ceasefire agreement negotiated between the U.S. and Turkey has come to an end. And Turkey and Russia have agreed on a deal over removing the Kurdish fighters from the Turkish-Syria border area. Our Hong Yu reports. Turkey and Russia agreed on Tuesday to remove the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces that are within 30 kilometers of the Turkish border. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan announced the agreement at a joint news conference after their summit in Sochi on Tuesday local time. Starting 12 p.m. noon of October 23rd, within 150 hours, YPG terrorists and their arms will be taken out of 30 kilometers depth. Their fortifications and positions will be destroyed. All YPG terrorists in the Talifat and Membiji will be taken off this area together with their arms. The Syrian Democratic Forces, a force that's part of the YPG militia, is seen as a terrorist group by Turkey because of their links to Kurdish insurgents in southeast Turkey. Under the agreement between Putin and Erdogan, Syrian and Russian forces will replace the American troops that have guarded the region for years together with the Kurds. After six days, these forces will jointly patrol the so-called safe zone, a 10-kilometer-wide area next to the Turkish border. Putin expressed satisfaction after the six-hour-long summit with Erdogan, describing the tense situation on the Syrian-Turkish border as a very important issue to resolve. We share Turkey's concerns about the growing threats of terrorism and the growth of ethnic tensions in the region. These tensions and the separatist mood in recent times were, in our opinion, artificially created by outsiders. When the ceasefire agreement negotiated between the U.S. and Turkey came to an end, the commander of the SDF informed the U.S. that all SDF forces had left the area. Displaced by war, thousands of Syrian Kurds have fled to neighboring Iraq to escape Turkey's military offensive. Hong Yu, Arirang News. Alzheimer's disease may no longer just be an incurable illness as the first drug that can slow the disease has been invented and is close to hitting the market. U.S. drug company Biogen says it has created the first therapy called aducanumab that could slow the degenerative disease. Currently, there are only drugs that can help with the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Planning to file the paperwork by early next year, the company will soon seek regulatory approval in the United States and eventually Europe. If approved, the drug will slow patients' clinical decline, allowing them to preserve more of their memory and everyday living skills. Time now for our Life and Info segment, where we focus on information useful for your everyday life. More and more people are choosing electric stoves over their gas counterparts as they come, usually in much more sleek designs and don't produce any harmful gases. However, recent incidents of fires caused by electric stoves here in South Korea are a stark reminder that they still 
require users to be careful. Park Se-young with more. From July to early October, three fires were caused by electric stoves at homes with cats. The stoves were switched on when the cats nudged a touchscreen power button. There are two types of electric stoves that are common in Korea. The conventional electric stove heats the top plate using heat rays, and the induction stove directly heats the cookware through electromagnetic induction. Neither of them cause fire sparks, and induction stoves only heat up special cookware. Although electric stoves tend to be safer than gas stoves, they still require people to be careful when using them. Just like locking the valve of the gas stove when not in use, electric stoves should be unplugged. If pulling out the power plug is too bothersome, using a power extension with a switch can make things easier. Also, flammable materials must of course be kept away from electric stoves. Induction affects objects with a magnetic force, so metal objects must be kept off of it even when not in use. The top plates of conventional electric stoves stay hot after use, so users should watch out not only for fires but also burns. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, before we get to the weather, South Korea is going to remove the label of Atopi on all functional cosmetics. This measure comes as concerns rise within academic circles that consumers rely on such cosmetics and allow their symptoms to actually deteriorate by not seeking medical treatment as a result. The Ministry of Food and Drug Safety said on Wednesday that it plans to notice the amendment of the cosmetics law enforcement in November and implement the law next year. Labels regarding the treatment of hair loss and acne, they will still be allowed. The new legislation includes adding whitening, wrinkle improvement, sun protection, mitigating hair loss, acne skin improvement and moisturising atopic skin to functional cosmetics labels. Good morning. Rain is in the forecast for southern and eastern parts of the country from this evening. Showers are likely to linger into tomorrow, so you will need an umbrella. The east coast will see somewhat heavy showers of up to 60 millimeters, while Jeju and parts of Gyeongsang Namdo province will see 5 to 30 millimeters. The rest will see sprinkles here and there. It's shaping up to be another warm day with higher than average temperatures for the capital area, while southern provinces will see highs hovering around the seasonal averages. Enjoy the warmer than average temperatures while they're here because things are about to get much cooler this week and next week it's going to feel much more like mid-autumn for sure. Back to today's forecast, mostly to partly cloudy skies will be featured for dry regions and daily highs will be in the low 20s in most parts of South Korea and thankfully we'll have clean air today. That's Korea for you and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. Well, that's all the news and weather we have for now on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. Do make sure you stay tuned to us here on Adidang TV. And uh, a reminder that our next newscast is coming up at noon Korea time with our very own E.G. Yoon. So until then, goodbye.